Hey, how's it going, my fellow witchers? So I figured today I'd go ahead and revisit a subject I've talked about before on my channel, and that is the use of platelet-rich plasma, also known as PRP, for the treatment of hair loss. So last time I addressed this subject, I touched on the theory a little bit, but I left my opinion pretty vague. So this time, rather than just addressing it, let's go full-blown mad dog of Shimano on this topic and get to the bottom of all of the hype. So... What is platelet-rich plasma, aka PRP? Well, it has been used by surgeons to promote wound healing for many years now, but over the last 10 years or so, there have been articles that have been appearing and popping up all over the internet about the use of PRP in the treatment of androgenic alopecia. So, what is PRP? Well, if you spin down blood in a centrifuge, what floats to the top is a yellow fluid containing proteins and platelets, also known as thrombocytes, while the red blood cells sink to the bottom of the vial. This plasma, as well as the platelets, contain a lot of potential wound healing factors, since that's what thrombocytes do. They help with wound healing. So naturally, people started asking the question, what happens if you inject this stuff into the scalp in people with androgenic alopecia? There are numerous articles on PRP for androgenic alopecia, so my approach will be to look at review articles or meta-analysis papers that combine the results of previous studies. And it turns out over the last three years or so, there were three such articles published, so this is a pretty popular topic. Now, not the cherry pick, I'll discuss in depth the most recent article, which also happens to be the most optimistic about PRP for treating hair loss. So you'll know I'm not cherry picking because, you know, I'm picking an article which is pretty... Uh, optimistic about the use of PRP here. So anyways, this article is titled Systematic Review of Platelet-Rich Plasma Use and Androgenic Alopecia Compared with Minoxidil, Finasteride, and Adult Stem Cell Based Therapy. So this meta-analysis is from Rome, Italy, and again was published just last year in 2020. They note that the number of articles on PRP has increased exponentially over the last 10 years. They then go on to discuss some of the mechanisms proposed for the benefit of PRP. They first mention that there is autologous activated and autologous non-activated PRP. Autologous just means the donor of the plasma is the same individual as the recipient. I mean, you are giving yourself your own plasma, which is good, because if you got plasma from a donor, your antibodies would attack it, and you could have an allergic reaction on top of that. So, anyways, activated Activated PRP basically means that the plasma is combined with some activator like thrombin that then releases the various growth factors and other stuff that is in the PRP. So some of the proposed mechanisms of PRP is that it stimulates what it is called the BCL2 protein, which is an anti-apoptotic regulator, meaning it helps prevent cell death. It also activates what is called the AKT pathway, which stimulates cell growth, and these effects lead to improving survival of dermal papilla cells, which are of course the cells that promote hair growth. Also, PRP upregulates a fibroblast growth factor pathway, which stimulates hair follicle stem cells and prolongs the antigen phase of the hair growth cycle. PRP also stimulates growth of the blood vessels at the hair follicle via increase in what's called vascular endothelial, endothelial growth factor, VEGF, and platelet-derived growth factor, PDGF. Now, this is not the same thing as what is known as the Blutflu theory. What it is is angiogenesis, meaning new blood vessels to the scalp. So in theory, it may reverse some of the damage DHT causes since DHT inhibits IGF-1, which in turn reduces neovascularization to the hair follicles. That is not the same thing as just increasing blood flu to the scalp. But sadly, this doesn't stop snake oil salesmen from trying to pitch this blood flu theory. So anyways, there are a lot of potential me mechanisms for the stimulation of hair growth in PRP. In androgenic alopecia, there is, as you guys know, a miniaturization of hair follicles, which is caused by a diminished antigen growth phase and an increased telogen resting phase, resulting in miniaturized hairs, although in this paper they refer to them as microscopic hairs, and that makes sense, because if you take a microscope to even a bald man's scalp, you're likely to find transparent hairs that are too small to be seen with the naked human eye. However, the number of hair follicle stem cells cells doesn't change. It doesn't matter how small a hair follicle is, it's the same no matter what, which suggests that maybe there is a missing activator or some inhibitor of hair growth that is present and we can just unlock it somehow to reverse the miniaturization process. Of course, we know that the trigger for this hair loss is the sensitivity of scalp hairs in genetically predisposed individuals to the trash hormone DHT. And I say genetically predisposed because keep in mind, people can still have high DHT levels and have a full head of hair if they don't have 
have the male pattern baldness gene. So anyways, the authors note that there is a lot of variability in how PRP is prepared, and so they are forced to lump together different techniques without being able to judge which methods of preparation are superior. So anyways, enough background on that. Let's examine what they looked at specifically. So in the various medical literature databases, they looked at and they found 163 articles just searching the keywords platelet-rich plasma androgenic alopecia. They then went through the articles to identify those that were randomized and had some kind of control group and were an androgenic alopecia population. So in other words, these were pretty high quality studies. Many studies were excluded because they were review studies, they were duplicates, or they combined PRP with other therapies, or they weren't studies in patients with androgenic alopecia at all. So from the 163 studies, they ended up with just 12 good quality studies to analyze. So they have some tables indicating the details of each study, but we are interested in the overall findings. So you can look this up if you want, but one thing that is interesting is that almost every study uses a different means to generate the PRP and has different ways of applying it. Another thing I noted in table one is that despite saying they picked out controlled randomized trials, some of the trials are not controlled or randomized as you can see here. You know, I don't know why they would include these studies here. I mean, they don't seem to meet their criteria of what kind constitutes a high quality study, but you know, here they are, I guess. I mean, uh, I guess they're interesting to see, but I think they probably should have just included the studies that met their definition of what constitutes a high quality study. I mean, otherwise, what's the point, right? So anyways, as far as what is really important though, let's go ahead and talk about outcomes. So in, in regards to outcomes, the studies did look at changes in things like hair density, hair count, hair thickness, hair regrowth, as well as hair cross-sectional size percentage using reliable instruments like a phototrichogram, which is the best tool after all for measuring hair count, since something like a photographic assessment, for instance, can just be subjective and also be influenced by things like lighting, hairstyling, a lot of other X factors that could make it less reliable. And again, as far as methods go, seven different devices were used to prepare the PRP, so it's impossible to determine which technique is best. And this is one of the problems with the state of the art of PRP at the present, is that there is in fact no standardization for preparing the PRP and delivering it to the patient. When you're combining results like you do in a meta-analysis, it is better to have everyone using the same techniques or else we can't determine what the best technique is since it just combines the results altogether. What would be a much better study on this would be if they directly compared each methodology to find out which one is the best, otherwise it's a little bit like combining apples and oranges. And as mentioned before, there are numerous growth factors in PRP, some or all which may help stimulate hair growth, so here's a list of some of the factors. So in addition to the differences in how the PRP was prepared, how the PRP was administered also varied from study to study. It can be injected by hand by a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon. There are also automatic injection systems, and the number of injections and time course of the injections also varied a lot. So in addition to the preparation of the PRP not being standardized, how it was administered was also not standardized, and again, this is a meta-analysis, so we can't determine which method is best since they are all combined together. So let's to the results. The researchers do discuss all 12 studies in detail, including differences in study design and patient populations, whether they are all male or a mix of male and female. The studies had small sample sizes, mostly only 10 to 30 subjects or so, and the largest study only had 64 patients, which isn't great, but it's what we have. They note there were no major side effects in the studies other than you know, headache and pain and swelling of the scalp during procedures, so that's not bad, nothing that's not tolerable or anything like that. But as far as effectiveness, 84% of the studies, which is 10 out of 12, showed a positive effect of PRP. Six studies showed statistically significant improvement, and four said there was improvement, but there were no statistics to back any of this up. So in two studies, there was no improvement of androgenic alopecia at all, but the two studies only used one or two treatments of PRP, and all the studies where three treatments were given showed improvement, which is a problem because as we established earlier, we don't know which methodology is best since the meta-analysis didn't compare them directly. So if you're seeking treatment for PRP, there is a 
chance one of these applications could be one of the two that didn't yield any results in the meta-analysis, so you're in a sense playing Russian roulette with your hair and your money, and that is important because PRP isn't cheap, and I'll get to that later, but given that it's not cheap, it is too bad you need at least three treatments before you notice any results at all, and we also don't know about the long-term efficacy, which again, I'll get to in a moment later in the video. But first, let's look at the literature on finasteride and minoxidil the researchers discussed in regard to antrenic alopecia, as well as other therapies like microneedling and LLLT, which you guys all know my opinion on by now, and they conclude that one advantage of PRP over drugs is that you have to take drugs over a long period of time. However, it is not clear from the article if you have to repeat PRP, and if so, how often you have to repeat it. I mean, since PRP is more invasive and undoubtedly costs more than other treatments, people may be less compliant than if they just need to pop a pill once a day, especially if you need to repeat these injections for good, which is likely because, you know, let's face it, a PRP injection is not going to stop DHT from destroying your scalp hair, so indefinite treatment of PRP does seem likely if you want to maintain results, just like any other treatment out there for male pattern baldness. Also, they note that hair count improvements are comparable between the results of finasteride and minoxidil, but the studies here didn't directly compare the therapies. So the title of the article is misleading because they don't actually compare PRP with finasteride or minoxidil, so this is just pure speculation. I mean, it could be comparable, but without a large randomized control trial that directly compares the two kinds of therapy, we really can't draw any conclusions. You know, for all we know, PRP is only a fraction as effective as minoxidil and as a finasteride and minoxidil combination, I should say. They then go into a long discussion once again on the theory behind PRP, but let's skip to their conclusions because establishing a theory is the easy part. It's outcomes that matter, not so much theory. So in regards to outcomes, they first conclude that PRP has shown benefit and could be an alternative to minoxidil, finasteride, and dutasteride. They think the data shows that you need at least three injections of PRP for it to work. The studies also seem to show that PRP works better in male patients with low to moderate androgenic alopecia. And finally, some kind of automated injection system is better than a manual injection. So the gender differences were interesting because it shows that androgens still play a factor here, which would indicate the need for prolonged PRP treatment for continued efficacy, which doesn't seem very practical since we're talking about expensive scalp injections versus just taking a pill and applying a topical solution daily. So my analysis on this subject would be a little bit different. I don't think the studies here are as high quality as they should be since they are not all randomized or controlled, and the types of PRP used are all prepared differently, and the number of subjects in each study is pretty low. Also, a number of studies didn't even do statistics like a p-value, so we don't even know if these results were due to just chance, which can happen often in research. So these are not good quality studies at all. I also don't think you can compare PRP to the FDA-approved drugs, which have a lot more data backing up their safety and efficacy. Finasteride and minoxidil were approved, but only after many, many studies involving thousands of animal and human subjects over a long period of time, as well as using control groups and statistics to rule out the possibility that the results were due to just chance. Indeed, this isn't just my opinion. There are other review articles and meta-analyses published the last few years that are much less optimistic about PRP as a treatment for hair loss. So, for example, this meta-analysis from 2018 concludes, quote, Local injection of PRP for antrotic alopecia might be associated with an increased number of hairs in the treated areas with minimal morbidity, but there is clearly a lack of scientific evidence on this treatment modality. Further studies are needed to evaluate the efficacy of PRP for antrotic alopecia, unquote. And this meta-analysis from 2019 concludes, quote, because of the low quality of the studies, small sample sizes, different treatment regimens, and possible publication bias, the results of this meta-analysis should be interpreted with caution. Furthermore, more randomized control studies should be performed, unquote. So like I mentioned, PRP is not cheap. The cost for PRP treatments, according to a Medical News Today article, are between 500 to 2,000 US dollars per treatment. If the article I reviewed is correct, and you need at least three treatments, that's a lot of money. And let's face it, you're going to need a lot more than just three treatments over the course of your lifetime, since there's no evidence that any of the results from PRP 
are permanent. I mean, compare this with finasteride, where if you really want to save money, you can buy a 5 milligram Proscar tablet and quarter it for 1.25 milligrams, which you can use daily like I do, or every other day, depending on what your doctor determines is appropriate for you. For me, 30 Proscar tablets cost 9 US dollars since I quarter them and use a 1.25 milligram quarter tablet daily, and that means 30 Proscar tablets just cost me 9 US dollars every four months. So the amount of finasteride I can buy for just one injection of PRP, and keep in mind, you need at least three to show an effect, is 18 years worth of finasteride, and that is assuming the PRP injection is on the cheaper end of $500. Otherwise, a 2000 US dollar shot would equal 74 years of finasteride, so effectively a lifetime of finasteride use. Furthermore, since PRP is considered a cosmetic procedure, it likely will not be covered by insurance, so you can assume the treatment will be on the pricier $2,000 US dollar side, and since you need at least three treatments, that's $6,000. So if you're paying that much, you might as well fork over just a little bit more for a hair transplant, since at least the results you get from a transplant are permanent and proven, and you can maintain your non-transplanted hairs through cheap pharmaceuticals like finasteride and generic minoxidil. And for most of us, even finasteride alone will probably be effective, as it's been shown even after 10 years, over 90% of patients maintain their results on finasteride safely. So the jury is not in yet for PRP, but even if it does work, it doesn't seem to be a practical treatment at all. It reminds me a bit of the studies I've seen on Botox, where there is potentially some promise, but the price and application is just so impractical that it would make adherence very difficult. There is no cure for hair loss after all, so any treatment options must be assumed to be a lifetime commitment. So in that respect, you might as well just stick to the most practical, inexpensive, not to mention effective treatment on the market, and that is... You guessed it, finasteride. Finasteride is the only treatment on the market that has been proven to be effective and safe in over 90% of patients, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. And studies have proven that even in studies where the sample size includes over 500 people evaluated over a period of 10 years where the patients had an extremely low incidence of side effects and either maintained or even continued to have hair growth. You can't say that about any other treatment on the market. There is simply not enough evidence. So, you know, I understand these days everybody is trying to reinvent the wheel here and there when it comes to hair loss treatments, but let's not kid ourselves here. There is not going to be anything else better on the market for perhaps decades. Sure, we have some promising treatments on the horizon, like, you know, we've all talked about clascoterone as well as obscure prostaglandin treatments, but it is going to be a long time before we know how its long-term efficacy stacks up against finasteride, especially since finasteride has been studied over a course of longer than 10 years. So, the sooner you you go ahead and take the red pill and just accept the fact that finasteride is the best thing we've got out there for the time being, the better it is going to be for your hair's future. The more time you spend dicking around with theoretical unproven treatments like PRP, the more likely it is you're going to just go bald and be a miserable slaphead for the rest of your life. So please, ignore the fear mongers and stick with the science and get on finasteride as soon as possible if you don't want to be bald. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and conclude. God bless America and may God protect our troops. Take care.